Masterclass. So we are live, guys. So good morning, everyone. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. For those joining us for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And we're really excited today to celebrate a new speaker joining us. So I'm going to introduce him in just a minute. But first, we have three classes joining us from across North America, and I want to give them a chance to say a bit of a hello. So we've got Mr. Bosak's group, grade four, is a new listener at Ontario who just joined us. So they might not be quite ready yet, but hi guys. How's it going? Hey, welcome in grade four. All right, we've got Miss Bulls' grade sixes in Raymond in Alberta. Hi guys. <laughs> Hi everyone, awesome. Love the enthusiasm. And then last but not least, we've got Miss Knight's grade threes in Chicago and Illinois, our lone American class. <laughs> Representing the entire U.S. with pure excitement, as we can see. Uh, of course, the reason we're all here today is for our speakers. We are joined live in Richmond, Hill, Ontario, by Tom Bassos for a tour of the universe. So he is a part of basically every amateur astronomy society that, that you could possibly be a part of. He has shared his work on television, in schools, and community centers all across the province of Ontario and beyond. Uh, and he's doing a TED Talk in just in tomorrow, I believe, uh, in, in Richmond Hill as well. So it's really exciting. We're so thrilled to have him here with us today. And so without further ado, thanks so much for joining us, Tom, and take it away. Thank you very much. And I'm really looking forward to our session today, looking forward to some great questions. So please start to get your, your questions ready. And uh, let's see what we can do. I'm going to share my screen here. And let's see if we can get that going. Okay, how's you're that? To, you're good to go, go for it, let's do it. Okay, great. Well, as you can see, I'm strong enough to carry uh, the moon, Jupiter, Saturn, and even a black hole, so you can see how strong I am. <laughs> let's take a look at what we're gonna cover today. I think we're gonna have a lot of fun. I wanna talk to you today about how astronomy is inspiring, mind-blowing, and lightning, and I'm even gonna to talk to you today about how astronomy can give you superhero powers. So I think we're gonna have a little bit of fun today. But let's start with number one of why astronomy is inspiring. And I thought I'd share a story with you about my inspiration and how I kind of got involved in astronomy and what got me excited. And maybe some of these examples will get you excited as well. When I used to look up at the night sky, as you can see by this picture, I used to think of stars as just these points of light in the sky that didn't move, that were just staying in the same place. And one day I was surfing around YouTube and I was shocked to learn about something called galactic cannibalism that shows how galaxies can actually crash together and merge together to form one galaxy. Now this is actually a computer animation because this would take you know a billion years to happen, but it's actually interspersed with an actual picture from the Hubble telescope right there showing two galaxies that have crashed together. Once again, the computer animation showing us what we think will happen when two galaxies crash. And there's evidence from the Hubble telescope showing the evidence of two galaxies crashing. And the amazing thing about this example is this is 200 billion stars all crashing together. And you would think that maybe thousands or millions of stars would actually crash together. But even in this animation here, space is mostly just that, empty space. So when these 200 billion stars crash together, it's likely that not any two stars will not even crash together uh, because they'll literally just fly past each other. And I'll hit that point home with this next example of introducing you to our nearest neighbor, Proxima Centauri. Uh, which you might have heard is only four light years away, which doesn't sound like much, but that's actually 41 trillion kilometers, which means that if we were to fly straight there with our fastest spaceship, which can fly at 700,000 kilometers an hour, 260 times faster than a speeding bullet, it would still take us 15,000 years to get there. And that's our closest neighbor, okay? And forget about trying to fly there in a Boeing 747. That would take you over 10 million years. So imagine that space is just that empty space. This was another inspiration of mine when the Hubble telescope took a picture of the sky on a spot that didn't appear to have any stars at all. But when it stared at this spot for 11 days straight, 
Look at what it discovered, 10,000 stars in this one tiny little spot in the sky. No, wait, that's not right. These aren't stars. What are they? Each of these smudges is a galaxy containing 100 billion stars, okay? So this one little picture, which is just one thirteen millionth of the sky, it would be like me looking through a, star, a, a straw up to the sky, contains 10,000 galaxies or one quadrillion stars and potentially quadrillions and quadrillions of worlds with the potential for alien life on them. So it's just mind boggling how big the universe is. Number two, astronomy is mind blowing. I thought I'd introduce you to some, some of the most bizarre and extreme things in the universe. And when I talk to audiences around the world, we as Canadians, there's one thing we love to complain about in Canada. And what is that? Of course, that's the weather. We love to complain about those miserable rainy days those miserable hot days like in India where it, it reached over 50 degrees Celsius, those miserable windy days, and all of that extreme weather that we get like Hurricane Irma, this huge storm uh, that was literally 300 kilometer an hour winds so big that it could swallow up almost all of Cuba and literally big enough to swallow up all of Florida here. But how does that compare to some of the weather that we get in the universe? Well, I thought I'd look that up. You might have heard about the big red spot on Jupiter, which is a massive storm. Well, guess what? Its winds are twice as fast as Hurricane Irma, and it didn't just last 16 days like Hurricane Irma did, but this storm has been raging for hundreds of years. And here's the other thing. Is this storm big enough to swallow up all of Florida? No, it's actually big enough to swallow up all of planet Earth. So this is how big this storm is, just huge. And what about if we visited Venus where they have their atmospheric pressure is 93 times what it is on Earth and it rains sulfuric acid. Imagine the umbrella you'd need there, which is nothing compared to visiting this planet where it actually rains rocks, okay? Or how about this giant blue planet, which is a thousand degrees Celsius, 20 times hotter than planet Earth, and it has 7,000 kilometer an hour winds, and it rains molten glass sideways, okay? So this is some of the extreme weather that we can't even imagine here on planet Earth. And what about this planet? NASA has discovered the first circumbinary planet, which is actually a planet that has two suns. Like in the movie Tatooine in Star Wars, it actually has two suns. Imagine if you lived on this planet, you would actually have two shadows. You would actually see two sunrises every day and two sunsets every day. So this would be a really weird world to live in. But even more bizarre than that, because science is even more bizarre and amazing than science fiction, is that NASA has found the first planet that's orbiting in a system with three suns. You can see the three suns here. And this planet, as it orbits in between these suns, it actually goes 140 straight Earth years where they, uh, of daylight. So imagine your parents having to wait 140 years before telling you to go to bed, okay? And then of course, black holes that people love to talk about. So here's an animation of what a black hole would look like. The black hole, uh, is the black part in the middle here where gravity is so powerful that not even light can escape. And around the black hole is this accretion disk flying around at near light speed over a billion degrees uh, of temperature, which is the uh, part we can spot. And it's amazing because Albert Einstein predicted these black holes 100 years ago, and we didn't discover the first one until 50 years ago. But it wasn't until this year that scientists actually got the very first picture of a black hole, which you might have seen, which is this one here, a black hole at the center of a galaxy called M87, 5.5 billion times the mass of our sun. The other amazing thing about this picture that was just taken this year, this is not the way this black hole looks right now. This is the way this black hole looked 55 million years ago because it took the light 55 million years to get from this black hole to reach us here on planet Earth. So that's another amazing fact about that picture.
And I often get asked the question is, well, what if, what if I ever fall into a black hole? You don't want to do that. But if you ever did, they actually have a scientific term for it. It's called spaghettification. That's right. If you were actually to fall into a black hole, you would be spaghettified and it would draw you into that black hole, starting with your big toe and then one atom at a time. And it would literally draw you into that black hole with its powerful gravity. <laughs> OK, number three, astronomy is light enlightening. Uh, and so, Jesse, if you could open up uh, so I can hear some of the classrooms, I want to show you a. a something in the Eagle Nebula. If anyone recognizes this picture, just yell it out. It's going to zoom in on it. And it, it's one of the most famous pictures ever taken by the Hubble telescope right here. Does anyone recognize what that is? Nebula. nebula. It is a nebula. That's correct. What's the name of that nebula? Orion Nebula. Orion yes, Eagle. Yeah. Yes, it's, it's in the Eagle Nebula, and it, those are called the Pillars of Creation, just an amazing nebula. But when we get pictures like this from Hubble, not only do we get these beautiful images, but we actually make amazing scientific discoveries. And in this particular picture, what scientists discovered was something called eggs or evaporating gas globules which is basically just a whole bunch of gas and dust accumulating together because gravity is pulling it together. Well, what happens when stuff gets crunched together? It rises in temperature. So it hits a million degrees, then 10 million degrees, then 18 million degrees. And as soon as this egg reaches 18 million degrees, guess what? Nuclear fusion occurs and a star is born. So just amazing discoveries like this that Hubble is, is opening up the world for. Number four, now I want to talk about how astronomy can give you superhero powers. Okay, so this is a section I called you and the universe. So let's start with how many bags of groceries you can carry. Jesse, just open it up to all the classrooms. Uh, just yell out a number. How many, when your parents come home with the groceries, how many bags of groceries can you carry? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Hey, good. I'm hearing two, three, and four. Okay, let's average it out to four if you're really strong. But the problem is you're basing your strength based on what you know about planet Earth. But guess what? You can carry more than four bags of groceries. If you want to carry more than four bags of groceries, all you have to do is travel to Mars when you grow up. And guess what? On Mars, you will be able to carry 10 full bags of groceries. But if that's not enough, all you have to do is travel 6 billion kilometers to Pluto, where you will be able to carry 56 full bags of groceries. And if that's not enough, I want you to grow up and be an astronaut and work on the International Space Station when you grow up. Because in microgravity on the International Space Station, you can carry four million bags of groceries. Okay, so there's your superhero strength that you didn't know you had. Okay, okay, let's move on. What other superhero powers do you have? When you look up in the sky, you might see a star called Betelgeuse, which is actually a star that's nearing the end of its life. It's this huge star that's about to explode in a supernova explosion. But guess what? When you go out tonight and you see Betelgeuse, you're not actually seeing it the way it looks tonight. You're actually seeing it the way it looked in the year 1377 because it took the light from Betelgeuse 642 years to reach us. So you are actually a time traveler. You are able to look back in time to see something the way it looked 642 years ago. Just amazing. And what are you made of? Uh, you've probably seen this in your science classes, the periodic table of elements. Well, guess what? We're learning how each of these elements is produced. So what's the most common element in your body? Well, a lot of people know that it's water, which is made up of H2O, hydrogen and oxygen. Well, guess what? All of the hydrogen in your body was produced 13.8 billion years ago at the time of the Big Bang. So you're pretty old, okay? And even the carbon and the nitrogen 
in your body was produced in exploding stars. Even the iron in your blood and the calcium in your bones was produced five to 10 billion years ago when stars exploded. So you are actually made of stardust. And next time someone asks you how old you are, don't say you're like 11 years old, just say I'm roughly five to 10 billion years old, okay? So now you know the real answer, okay? Next, fun facts about the universe and you. What's the fastest? Uh, open it up to the audience there, Jesse. Uh, who can yell out what the fastest thing in the universe is? Light. That's right. Light is the fastest thing in the universe. It travels 300,000 kilometers every second. It can go around all of planet Earth seven and a half times in one second. It's pretty fast. Who can tell me what the second fastest thing in the universe is? Sound. A lot of people say sound, but it's actually not sound. Okay, I'm going to give you a hint. What's the second fastest thing in the universe? I'll give you a hint. Superman. That's right. It's Superman. Okay. Okay, super, Superman's not real. How fast is Superman? Superman is faster than a speeding bullet, right? Now, it got me thinking. How fast is a speeding bullet? So I Googled it. As it turns out, a speeding bullet travels at 2,700 kilometers an hour. When you are driving down the highway with your parents, this speed is about 25 times faster than your car is traveling. That's pretty fast. Now, how does that compare to how fast you and I can travel? Well, guess what? Even though a bullet travels at 2,700 kilometers an hour, you might not realize this, but right now, you are rotating because the earth is actually rotating on its axis, isn't it? And you're traveling at 1200 kilometers an hour. That's half the speed of a speeding bullet. But guess what? Our whole, so our whole earth is rotating around the sun at 40 times faster than a speeding bullet. And that's not fast enough because we're actually rotating around the Milky Way at 300 times faster than a speeding bullet and the entire Milky Way is flying through the universe at 2 million kilometers an hour. As you sit there in your chair, you are flying at 800 times faster than a speeding bullet. Can everyone feel the wind in your hair? All right? <laughs> okay, cool. That means every night you in your bed unknowingly travel 50 million kilometers across the universe. So sweet dreams, my friend. <laughs> Okay, but you're probably saying, Tom, you know, that's cheating. Superman gets to fly around buildings and save Lois Lane and stuff like that. And, and we're just lying in bed. It, it doesn't feel like we're flying. No problem. I have an answer to that, to how you can actually fly. Because all you have to do is travel on your next vacation about a billion and a half kilometers and visit Saturn's moon Titan, where the atmosphere is so thick and the gravity is so weak that you can literally strap on wings and fly on Saturn's moon Titan. Now you wouldn't know that because you can't do that on planet Earth, but if you were on Titan, you could actually do that. And if that's a little too far to travel, no problem. All you have to do is travel 400 kilometers straight up to the International Space Station where you'll be able to fly like Superman in microgravity, like NASA astronaut Peggy Whitson is here. And by the way, just a little shout out, shout out to Peggy. Uh, Peggy was actually the first female astronaut to become the commander of the International Space Station. So hopefully all you uh, girls out there and boys out there can have something to aspire to when you grow up and be like Superman. <laughs> okay, so in summary, you can fly at over 2 million kilometers an hour. You have the power to look back in time. You can lift 4 million bags of groceries. You are billions of years old. You are made of stardust. Jesse, open up the, open up the uh, microphones to all the classes. How about a big hand for everyone in the audience? Okay, great. So in conclusion, I wanted to say, let's harness our fear of the unknown as inspiration to unravel the mysteries of the universe. That ends what I wanted to cover today. Let's open it up to some questions and answers, hopefully.
Outstanding. Well, thank you so, so much, Tom. If you want to come out of screen share, it'd be great to see you again. Uh, for all our classes, thanks for the, such fantastic participation. I also want to note we've got seven groups watching on YouTube right now, and we've already got a bunch of questions from Ms. Herman's class in Oceanside, New York. So thank you guys so much for that. But for other classes watching, if you want to type in some questions, I'll happily share as many as we can. But let's start with some live classes. So Mr. Bosak's class, if you guys want to come up and kick us off, uh, you are unmuted and uh, ask away. Uh, we have one student here that's wondering if you guys believe aliens are real. Yeah. We covered it so quickly, Tom. Thank you so much. I love those. That, that always gets brought up in space presentations. Fantastic. Yeah, I'm actually doing a TED Talk tomorrow on that exact topic. So he, here's my theory, because uh, 70 years ago, uh, a physicist by the name of Enrique Fermi asked that exact same question. If the universe is so huge, and there's so many trillions of worlds out there. Why haven't those aliens visited us? And is there really aliens out there? So let me give you my theory about whether I think that there are or not. So first of all, I believe that the universe is so huge and there's so many trillions and trillions of worlds, each with the possibility of life, that there is actually life, that the universe is teeming with life throughout the universe. Now there's two kinds of life that it could be teeming with. One is microbial life, tiny little bacteria that are kind of floating around in the water and stuff like that. I think there's absolutely no doubt that there's all kinds of microbial life living out there. But we're more interested in intelligent life, maybe aliens that might be able to visit us on planet earth. Maybe they'll be able to send us a radio signal to communicate with us. And Although I believe that's the case, that there could be a large number of worlds with intelligent life, there's two problems with us ever meeting the aliens. One is that the universe is so huge. So once again, I mentioned that closest star, they'd have to travel for 15,000 years just to get, get to us. And, and what, if, what if they're 100 light years away? Then that's going to take them millions of years. So the problem is the cosmic distances are so great that we literally may never ever get to meet those aliens. Uh, and the part B of that story is, uh, is the time element in it. We are just, we are just a, a speck of time in, in the cosmic life of the universe. So the universe has been around for 13.8 billion years, but guess what? Humans have only been around for a couple of hundred thousand years. And that sounds like a long time, but if we were to condense the entire history of the universe into one calendar year, guess what? The dinosaurs didn't show up until December 26th to December 28th, and humans didn't arrive until eight minutes to midnight. So those aliens could have visited this neighborhood throughout the whole year. They never would have met us unless they arrived between eight minutes to midnight and midnight. So timing it such that one intelligent species arrives at the same time that another intelligent species exists is near impossible as well. So my answer is yes, I think there's all kinds of aliens. Chances are we'll never meet them. Well, thank you so much. What a thoughtful answer. And if you guys are planning on going to the TED Talk tomorrow, you don't need to anymore. It's been covered. Perfect. <laughs> <There you go. laughs> Thanks, Tom. Uh, all right, uh, Ms. Bowles' class, if you guys have a question, come on up. Um, how did they take out Pluto out of the galaxy? Ah, why is Pluto no longer a planet? We also always get this. I love it. Oh, <laughs> Way to go, guys. We love the Pluto question. Okay. So Pluto was discovered many decades ago. And, and as we were growing up, we thought we had nine planets. Uh, but as scientists were learning more and more about our solar system, we found that there was a whole bunch of other, quote, planets that looked like planets in the same neighborhood that Pluto is. Pluto's way out there, like six billion kilometers or something. And because there were so many other objects like Pluto in that area, we kind of thought, well, we got a choice now. We can now say we've got 50 planets or we can kind of kick Pluto out of the planet realm and call it a dwarf planet. Uh, and then we'll call all of those other objects in the neighborhood uh, dwarf planets as well. I think Pluto should still be a planet because not only is it a really cool planet, but a lot of people don't realize this, Pluto actually has five moons. 
Uh, it has one called Chiron that actually is almost big as Pluto itself. We've only got one moon, you know, Pluto has five. <laughs> um, but it has to do with the International Astronomical Union that's out there. They make the rules about how to name things, etc. And so I guess the good news is we can still be proud of Pluto. We just have to call it a dwarf, a dwarf planet. Yeah, I think that's the best thing to stress. And this topic comes up all the time is just that it's so spectacular. It's not to say that it's not a spectacular body in the solar system. It just doesn't have the same designation anymore. It's still worth exploring, still worth but, but I felt so strongly about it. I actually put a petition online to actually get it called a planet again. Yeah. <laughs> uh, by the way, just to get into the slightly more detailed description of that, there's a number of criteria that an object has to meet to become a planet. The gravity has to be so strong that it has to be uh, fairly round like the planets are. Uh, but one of the other criteria is that it has to have cleared its orbit. So the eight planets have mostly cleared out a whole bunch of the debris and asteroids and all that that's in their area. But where Pluto is in that orbit, there's like trillions of all of these tiny objects that haven't been cleared out. And that was one of the criteria that got Pluto demoted to dwarf planet status. Very cool. Well, thank you so much, Tom. All right, uh, Miss Knight's class, if you guys have another qu uh, question, come on up. So many hands up, so little time, I love it. Yeah, you're good to go. Ask the question, please. No, Kate, ask the question, please. What is the difference between astrology and cosmology? Between what and cosmology? Astronomy. Astronomy and cosmology? Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So astronomy is basically the study of all things in the universe. So it's everything from what we call baryonic matter, which is planets and stars and objects and moons and asteroids and all that kind of stuff. And it's also the study of a bunch of stuff we don't know much about, things that are called like dark matter and dark energy, which make up actually 95% of the universe that we're still learning about. So astronomy is the study of all those objects. And astronomers tend to use telescopes and look up to the sky, take, take pictures of those objects, study them, learn about their orbits, all of those kinds of things. Cosmology, on the other hand, is taking a lot of that information, but cosmology is basically the study of the birth, evolution, and fate of the universe. So it's looking at all that evidence and starting to make scientific theories and predictions about, okay, now that we've seen all that stuff, let's, let's for example, predict that the universe started with a big bang 13.8 billion years ago. And since then a whole bunch of stars developed and black holes developed and so the universe evolved. Cosmology also looks at how the universe is going to end, how it's going to die in the end. So for example, there's, there's theories about that. One was a theory called the big crunch that the universe is going to expand, expand, expand for billions of years but then gravity's going to take hold and it's all going to come back together and crunch back down into one spot the way it started at the time of the Big Bang. However, there's an, another theory called the Big Chill or the Big Freeze that says, no, it's not going to crunch back down on it because something seems to be pushing all of these galaxies farther and farther away from each other. So we're probably going to end trillions of years from now in a big chill where everything just kind of dies out stars lose their stars stars lose their energy their fuel they burn out black holes radiate out and they die and so that's the kind of thing that cosmology looks at is let's study birth evolution and fate of the universe very cool thanks tom and, and that's a question we've never got before so i love it um, all right, Ms. Herman's class, Oceanside, New York, grade sixes again. Uh, they have a bevy of questions on YouTube, but I want to share just one quickly, which is Ethan wants to know, what exactly is a light year? A light year. Yeah. Okay. So a light year is the distance that light travels in one year. So that distance happens to be about 9.5 trillion kilometers, roughly 6 trillion miles. 
So that's pretty far, okay? And as I mentioned, our nearest star is four light years away. So the reason why we use light years is because the universe is so huge that we'd be saying, you know, this object is 18 quadrillion, 900 trillion, 482 billion. So it's just easier to get this much huger uh, measurement called a light year. So that's one of the reasons why the term light year became popular as a way to measure these huge cosmic distances. Yeah. You also mentioned already that we can, you know, sort of see back in time uh, telescopes and, and our eyes are like, are like time machines and that we can see something that's many light years away. And I've always loved the analogy that like if Betelgeuse, say you said 650 or so light years, if it were to have blown up 500 years ago, we would not know that for another 150 years because the light telling us that information has not yet made it here, which is very Exactly. Cool. Exactly. All right. Let's go back through another round of live questions, guys. Mr. Bosak's class, if you guys have another one, come on up. Hello there. Uh, we do have another one. One of our students wanted to ask, are you able to see things like the International Space Station from Earth? Yes, good question. So yes, you can. You can see it as this tiny little light that goes across, across the sky. And by the way, there's some great ways uh, to actually see it and know when it's coming by your particular area. So you may or might, may not realize there's lots of great apps on the internet that you can download. For example, one is called Sky Safari. So I happen to have it on my phone here. What Sky Safari lets you do is go out at night, open up the app and literally just hold it up to the sky. And as you look in different directions, it'll tell you, okay, that's that star there, that's Jupiter there, that's Mars, that's Venus. And apps like Sky Safari will even show you when the International Space Station is flying by. So it'll help guide you in terms of which way to look. It'll tell you which direction it's going in. And then hopefully you can look up. And if you have a, a night that's not too cloudy, you will be able to spot that very faint light just going across the sky. The, the International Space Station is actually not, not all that far away. It's only about 400 kilometers up. Uh, which those of you in Ontario is roughly the distance from Toronto to Ottawa. It's not a huge distance, uh, but it's still a fairly tiny object once you get that far away. Yeah, and can I stress, so I hadn't seen it myself until just last year, and it is so much fun to be able to look at one of these apps. A uh, Spot the Station by NASA is another one, and you can literally go on, see when it's going to go. You know, 10.15, it's going to be crossing for a minute and a half, and you can watch it, and it's really spectacular. So I urge you guys to do that, and you can see it no matter how big uh, your city's in. In Toronto, you can see it quite visibly. So it's Yeah, and the amazing, the amazing thing about the International Space Station, I mean, those astronauts and the International Space Station are flying at 27,000 kilometers an hour, 10 times faster than a speeding bullet. They actually orbit the entire planet Earth every 90 minutes. So uh, if you miss it one time, you just wait 90 minutes and you potentially catch it again. Yeah. And so for what it's worth for that class, actually, just right now. So tonight at 639, uh, for two minutes near Sudbury area, uh, you'll be able to see it in the sky at, at 38 degrees. So I'll pass along that link when we're done so you can check that out. But great question. All right. Uh, Miss Bowles' class, if you guys want to come up for a second question, go for it. So we have one from the back here. Yeah. Uh, what would happen if our galaxy crashed yeah. into another? Okay, so the question is, what would happen if our galaxy crashed with another galaxy? It's interesting that you asked that question because one of our nearest neighbors, neighborhood galaxies called Andromeda, uh, we have <clears throat> in the Milky, our galaxy, the Milky Way, we have roughly 200 to 400 billion stars. We're not sure, but Andromeda might have up to a trillion stars. So it's a, it's a pretty big galaxy. And guess what? Our galaxy and the Andromeda galaxy are rushing towards each other at 100 kilometers per second. We are on a collision course with Andromeda, okay? Now, before you get too worried, it's gonna take about 4 billion years before it reaches us, okay? So it's gonna take a while, so hopefully we don't have to worry too much about it. And it's gonna be interesting because as that galaxy comes crashing towards us, the first thing, as it gets close, we're gonna look up into the night sky and we'll see two galaxies. We'll see the Milky Way on one side and we'll see Andromeda on the other side. It's gonna be a spectacular view. 
And then over the next billion years or so, those two galaxies will literally crash through each other, come back to each other and crash through each other again, and then come back to each other and merge into one galaxy called an elliptical galaxy. Right now, both the Milky Way and Andromeda are what are called spiral galaxies, but they will merge into one elliptical galaxy, which will be just one great big ball of stars. And once again, because there's so much empty space in the universe, when that collision crash happens, it might not even affect us at all because literally stars will just fly past each other at great distances. So even if it does occur when humans are on uh, around planet Earth, it might not be something that ends life on Earth, for example. Okay. Awesome, very cool question, guys. All right, uh, Miss uh, Knight's class, come on up for a second question, guys. I love all the hands going up. Yes, <laughs> best problem to have. <laughs> oh, say that again. For whatever reason, it takes your audio a few seconds to kick in, so now you're good. Stars made. What are stars made of? No, how are stars made? Oh, how are stars made, Tom? Okay, so stars are made in a few different ways, but as I mentioned earlier, as gas and dust come crashing together, the more you crash things together, the higher the temperature goes. So as I mentioned, it hits a million, 10 million, 18 million degrees. And when it hits 18 million degrees, something called nuclear fusion occurs. So that gets right down to an atom level where hydrogen atoms smash together, produce something called helium, and, and all of a sudden energy is produced from that collision. So that is how the star is formed. And now it has all of this fuel in the form of hydrogen and helium and things like that, that allow it to burn that fuel for many, many years. Our sun uh, happens to be a sun that's about five, four, four and a half to five billion years old. And it's got enough fuel to last about another five billion years. Okay, so that's, that's the good news. We'll have to figure something else out after that. <laughs> um, but other stars, that are a lot smaller uh, can actually last tri a trillion years uh, because they're not burning the fuel as quickly as our sun is. So we're learning a lot about stars, how they work, how they're born, how they use their fuel, just because one of the reasons the Hubble telescope is just getting us so much information about the pictures that it's taking and scientists are then discovering uh, the details behind a lot of what's happening. Outstanding. Thanks so much, Tom. All right. Uh, we're going to take four more questions, one more from YouTube, and then we're going to dive back through with another live uh, series of ones with our, our class that are here with us. So I wanted to pass along Rosie's question from Miss Herman's class on YouTube, and she wants to know, would humans ever be able to live on any of the other planets or moons in the solar system? Okay. So that's a question that scientists are, are quite often asking themselves. So uh, folks like uh, Elon Musk of SpaceX talks about, hey, let's have a, let's have a colony on Mars and have uh, 10,000 people living there or something. Um, it's not easy for us to live elsewhere in our solar system. For example, on Mars, one of the differences between Mars and planet Earth is the temperature. It's a lot colder on Mars than it is on planet Earth. So that's one thing. Uh, but the other thing is because Mars lost its magnetic shield probably about three or four billion years ago, it's getting bombarded by, by cosmic rays from our sun that basically wiped out 99% of all the atmosphere on Mars. So there's no atmosphere uh, to breathe. And that radiation from the sun, because there's no magnetic field protecting it, that's very dangerous for humans. So if we were to live on a place like Mars, we would have to shield ourselves from those really harmful rays, either with really thick walls or living underground on Mars or whatever. Uh, so there's a lot of things we would have to do to be able to live on other planets. The other one, of course, people talk about is on the moon. Uh, and by the way, uh, for Mars, the humans are talking about actually landing uh, on, back on the moon by 2024, so in about five years from now. Uh, but possibly in the mid-2030s to actually send humans to Mars. So in your lifetime, 
we could actually land humans on Mars. It's unlikely that we will be advanced enough to have them live there for a long time. We want to get them home as quick as we can because of the radiation, because of having no gravity. As soon as you're in places with no gravity, like traveling eight months in a spaceship to get to Mars, your bones start to waste away, your muscles start to waste away. So there's all kinds of things that make it very, very difficult for us to live anywhere else in our solar system. Very, very cool. And what a great answer. Again, it's a question we get a lot. I always like to share it. And so uh, awesome, guys. All right, we're going to take one each in the rest of our live classes again. So let's start again with Mr. Bosak's class. Come on up, guys. Hello there. So we got a question here. How many stars are there? Ooh, <laughs> no, no pressure. <laughs> okay, so uh, I'll give you a little bit of a convoluted answer. So the, the, the main part of the answer is we don't know. But one of the estimates is that there's about 100 billion galaxies in the observable universe. Each of those galaxies has about 100 billion stars. So you start to do the math. We're starting to get to a really, really big number. Uh, one of the European universities, though, did some more research that suggested it might not even be 100 billion galaxies. It might be 2 trillion. So somewhere in that range, it's a really big number. But guess what? That's just the observable universe because we can only see light that took 13.8 billion years to get to us. The actual universe itself might be thousands or millions of times bigger than the observable universe. <laughs> so all of a sudden we have to multiply it by an even bigger number. Uh, but just to get you mind boggled even more, a lot of scientists believe that not only do we live in our universe where the Big Bang happened 13.8 billion years ago and created our universe, but if the Big Bang happened once here to create our universe, maybe we live in a multiverse where the Big Bang happened thousands of other times. So now all of a sudden there could be an infinite number of other universes in this multiverse that we live with. We haven't found definitive evidence that that's the case, but if it was the case, the, the right answer to how many stars are out there might be an infinite number of stars, and we just don't really know yet. Very, very cool. One of my favorite analogies for this is the idea that if you imagine all the beaches in all the countries of the world, uh, if you think of all the grains of sand that make up those beaches, there are way more stars in the universe than there are grains of sand in all the beaches of the world. Not even close. All uh, the beaches but, and all the deserts. Yeah. So yes, all the deserts. So it's it's really unfathomable, but it's a great question and a way to explain the scale uh, of the universe, which is really neat. Um, by the way, before we go to our next question, I think we can all agree Mr. Bosak needs to do radio. You've got the best voice of all time. Uh, all right. <laughs> that said, Ms. Bowles' class, uh, come on up, guys, if you have another question. What can you hear in space? Ooh. What can you hear in space? That's a great question because when you're way out in space, in the vacuum of space, you actually can't hear anything because sound requires some type of medium to flow through. So that's kind of the answer there. However, there are things that can float through space at light speed, like radio waves and x-rays and many other forms of, uh, of light. Um, those can travel through space. And if, if an alien species on some other exoplanet thousands of miles away, or millions of miles away actually sent that radio signal that would in fact travel through space and we on planet earth here could capture that signal and listen to whatever those aliens were saying to us so super cool you know speaking of that i just want to share it with our classes because a lot of classes and, and students might not know um, not necessarily waves but we sent something out called the voyager record um a few decades ago could you explain a little bit about that for our classes yeah, so Voyager was a, a spacecraft that we sent out uh, past our solar system. It's actually outside our entire solar system now, beyond the effect of our sun. Uh, I think it's like 25 light hours away or something now. It's quite a, quite, a, quite a far distance. And on that spacecraft, 
we thought, you know, we should put something on here in case it travels for thousands of years and an alien finds it. And so they actually put some information on a disc, some type of disc on that, on that spacecraft that included uh, people saying hello in many different languages and music from Chuck Berry and all kinds of messages from presidents around the world. So there was a whole bunch of things we, we put onto this thing and a picture of what a, a human male and female looked like so that, that people could get an idea of, of who sent this message. So whether or not anyone will ever see that message, who knows, but we thought we would send our mark out into the universe in case millions of years from now, some alien picks up that signal and picks up that spacecraft. A message in the bottle in the cosmic ocean. Very cool. Uh, all right. And then I know we could go all day, but you guys are super enthused and it's fantastic. But let's wrap up with one last question from Ms. Knight's class. If you guys want to come up, I'll just give it a second for your audio to kick in and then uh, you'll be good to go. I think. Yep, you should be good. Oh, not yet. I don't know why. Sorry, give it two seconds. Uh, it wants to work. Let me toggle you off and on again. See if that does the trick. Sorry for the trouble, guys. Uh, try now. No, it's not doing it. Okay, so I'm going to leave your mic on. And then for Miss uh, Knight, if you want to take your question in the chat bar, that should do it too. And then I can ask Tom a question while you're doing that, okay? And we'll see if your audio works by then. So Tom, but while they're waiting for that question to come on, um, you passed along a bunch of resources to me before this session that I've already, sh I will be sharing with, uh, in a, with an email with all our classes. Can you tell us a little bit more about how kids can learn more about space? Like when they're done this presentation, how do they get more engaged? What can they look up? Uh, okay, so one of the things, can I share just to quickly show that one slide? Yeah, please go ahead. Um, just to give you an idea, uh, a lot of people don't realize that NASA is releasing a lot more information uh, to the public that the public can get involved in, in becoming a citizen scientist. Uh, do you see that screen okay? We sure do. Okay. So, for example, you can, you can get involved in sites like uh, Boink, Zooniverse, and spacehack.org, where real data from NASA is being posted, uh, where you can do things like search through images of what's out there and data of what's out there to, for example, look for uh, exoplanets that are in the habitable zone of their solar system where there might be life. So citizens are getting involved in looking at that data because NASA doesn't have enough scientists to look through these millions and millions of images and data points that they now have. Another example is NASA has posted information like images of near earth objects. So citizens can look through it and potentially, potentially spot an asteroid which might be on a collision course with planet earth, <laughs> okay? So as a citizen scientist, you literally could be involved in uh, finding an asteroid and you could save all of planet Earth. So I, I encourage <laughs> teachers to take a look at some of these resources and determine if, if any of them are at the right level for some of your classrooms to actually look through some of this real data and participate uh, as a citizen scientist. Uh, I'll also mention, I mentioned to Jesse that I wanted to give a free copy of my book to everybody. So following this uh, event, he's gonna send a link out to everybody with a free copy of my ebook, which has links to hundreds of videos, TED Talks, TV documentaries, stuff like that, but also uh, another set of resources that he's going to send out, uh, uh, which have like uh, some uh, some e other ebooks from NASA about planets and another ebook about Ein Albert Einstein. So some great resources like that. So hopefully that will be uh, that will be useful. Outstanding. Thanks so much, Tom. And yeah, Ms. Knight's class, you guys are back in business. So if you want to come up and ask that question, go for it. Ooh, do you know what there was before the Big Bang, Tom, and what caused the Big Bang to happen? <laughs> I got that question from a seven-year-old at one of my events that I did just a little while ago. Okay, so what happened before the Big Bang? So the, the answer is we don't know. Because as we analyze 
the mathematics behind what happened in the very first milliseconds uh, of the, the Big Bang happening, all of the math that we have starts to break down at that point. So, but we're getting a really good idea of what happened starting from a millionth of a millionth of a millionth of a second after the Big Bang, but no evidence of what happened before the Big Bang. However, I will answer that there's two primary theories that talk about what the answer to that is. One is that the universe started by something called a singularity, a very tiny spot of infinite temperature and infinite density, and nothing else before that. And all of a sudden that thing burst into uh, the Big Bang and creating the universe itself. There is another theory though, uh, that the Perimeter Institute talks about, that's a, a main research physics institute in Waterloo, Ontario, called the Big Bounce. And so they have another theory, unproven, but they're trying to do research into it that says, no, there was something before the Big Bang. There was another whole universe and that whole universe existed, but gravity eventually started pulling it back together and it came together and crashed into a big crunch. Uh, like I mentioned, our, our universe might have, but it doesn't look like it's going to. So there was another universe, it crashed into a big crunch and then it bounced back out uh, to create our universe. So that's the, the big bounce theory. Another universe existed, it crunched down, it bounced back up and it created another universe. So that's a, a second main theory about what might have happened before the Big Bang. Very cool. And I mean, this is stuff that is the subject of research all over the world. These are really complicated questions that a lot of really brilliant people have been working on for decades. So we really appreciate you guys asking them. And so guys, uh, that's, that's the end of our session. I love the enthusiasm. You guys have such great questions. I passed along the links to learn more. And so at the end of every one of our sessions, what we do is I'm gonna demute all of your microphones. And so boys and girls, if you guys could get ready to join me and saying a huge thank you to Tom, you are all now demuted, go for it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you guys so, so much. And Tom, such a pleasure having you. Thanks so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. Have a nice day, everyone.